Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Age with your host, Warasa Zainab. Victims of domestic violence or domestic abuse, if they are men, they are not taken seriously. They are often treated as um, a joke or something which is non serious. Male victims of abuse or violence are often ignored, not taken seriously, and this is the main reason why they often choose to remain silent and they don't speak out. Lots of people who are in a position like this, who are currently in an abusive relationship or have escaped an abusive relationship, choose to not report it to the police or any social services or don't even confide to their friends and family members out of fear of being judged, made fun of, or just ignored. It is a serious issue and it affects lots of people around the globe. Statistics are shockingly high, and during the pandemic, we have seen an alarming rate of increase in domestic abuse cases amongst men. People often automatically assume that a man cannot be abused because they are perceived as the stronger sex, as somebody who is well capable of protecting themselves. But unfortunately, sometimes this is not the case. There is emotional manipulation and neglect and many other forms of coercive control that does destroy lives. Today is a very special episode because this is the month of October and October is associated with Domestic Abuse Awareness Month. We have invited three amazing guests from this organization working actively in the UK to help victims and survivors of domestic abuse. We have three special guests from Break the Silence UK, an organization that is working round the clock to support the survivors and victims. Today with us, we have Lee, um, who is the CEO, and um, he is an amazing person who has not only utilized his life experiences to establish an amazing organization like this, but he has also written an amazing book on the subject that is being used across many parts of UK to teach people about coercive control and domestic abuse against men. We also have Josh Munro on the show, who is also the director of this fantastic organization. Welcome to the show, Josh. Hi, thank you. And we have Amy, Amy Peoples, who is also the director of Break the Silence UK, and she is also a criminologist by profession. So to our esteemed guests, a very warm, warm welcome to Age. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for having us. An honor. So, um, Lee, I'll start with you because you are the CEO. Um, if you could tell our audience what inspired you to establish an organization like this, do you feel there was a need? Is Was there anything that was lacking uh, in UK when it comes to supporting male victims? Absolutely. There are agencies out there and there have always been agencies out there to support male victims but it's very limited uh, I myself used to work um, in the area that I live um, supporting male victims of abuse um, and it was just me for the whole county uh, which was very very difficult uh, I left that role and you know I went into work in substance misuse uh, which is another passion of mine um, but it became very, very apparent still that there was a lot of domestic abuse going on uh, that was coming to the forefront in that field as well. And people were asking me about it because of my experience. It was only really when uh, we watched the BBC documentary Abuse by My Girlfriend that was on, which was the story of Alex Skeel, who was a high profile male victim, uh, that actually got me quite upset and got me thinking, you know, things haven't changed over these years that I've been doing this. What can I do differently? Which led to writing a book, which both Josh and Amy were involved in, in the process all the way through. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, with the name really, if, you know, if we help one person, that of was course. an achievement for us, but it was so much bigger, uh, which led to us firstly creating our website um, and our organization and we've just gone from strength to strength there in terms of what we do supporting victim survivors but also what we do to educate professionals and anybody else that's interested in learning more about the field of domestic abuse yeah 
Thank you so much for that. Before we go further into this topic, I would like our audience to watch this clip that has been produced by Break the Silence UK to raise awareness about the issue and educate the audience. So we'll join you after this short clip. Stay tuned. It's estimated that every year over two and a half million people in the UK from various backgrounds will experience domestic abuse. During the global pandemic that has gripped the world over the last year, call centres providing support saw dramatic rise in cases of between 80 and 150 per cent. Victims of every type of abuse, trapped within the walls of their homes with no way to escape their abuser. This needs to stop. It's time to lift the lid on the true extent of domestic abuse. We at Break the Silence UK say no more. No more will we stand by and watch whilst innocent victims continue to suffer at the hands of their abuser. We at Break the Silence UK offer an inclusive service to all victims and survivors that access our support. We support women, we support men. Regardless of gender or sexual orientation, if you are a victim of domestic abuse, we are here for you. Through our one-to-one -one support. Through our structured programmes. Through our advocacy work and training for professionals. Through helping you in any way that we can. We at Break the Silence UK do care and we will support you. If you need help, access our website at www breakthesilenceuk.co.uk Let us help you break your silence. Welcome back to Agony. That was a clip from Break the Silence UK. Um, Coming back to our esteemed guests in this amazing panel that we have today on the show. Um, coming back to you, Amy, um, you've studied criminology and people often don't understand that hitting someone, controlling someone, abusing in any way or form is a crime in this country. And yeah. when it comes to relationships, intimate partner relationships, people often ignore certain signs and red flags. I want you to share your thoughts on the statistics um, when it comes to male victims of domestic abuse and how it is a crime. Um, male victims, from my experience, tend to have the same, um, what's the word? They, they suffer the same types of abuse as women. Um, the, it doesn't appear from, from what we've seen that that men suffer any different to women. They're just less likely to come forward. Um, so, I mean, we try not to compare because when you look into it, the types of abuse are comparable. So the coercion and control, the, um, the violence, um, yeah. the, the love bombing. So, and, and, and often like playing, um, like the victim making, um, making a victim feel sorry for them um yeah so it is it's part of manipulation um you know using children within the coercion and control so they stay mm. financial abuse emotional abuse it's it's all very very similar i mean with the case that lee was talking about with with alex that was yeah. you know that that was horrendous um but sadly not not in isolation of of, of just the only case that that we've heard of of that you know of, of happening to it's uh yeah it's, it's poignant it's just people it's just men i think with regard to how society is today 
don't speak up mm. and we want to try and break those barriers um so That's they feel comfortable in in speaking to anybody just to sort of wave that white flag and say you know i'm being abused help me there's no shame in that at all yeah yeah um josh why do you feel um when it comes to cases of male victims of domestic abuse and survivors why are cases underreported? prevents people from coming forward and opening up or sharing what they're going through with the right support agencies so well, even with support agencies there are limitations on what they can provide because um in a previous organization i worked for as an independent domestic violence advisor my caseload was mm -hmm. primarily women because there wasn't enough funding for me to solely work with male victims because not many in that county were coming forward um, mm -hmm. in terms of barriers for men again as amy said um they are very similar in terms of being falsely accused of um, actually being the perpetrator um, had negative experience with the police. We've had clients that have been, um, in, ess in essence, laughed out of the um, see, uh, the police office, and it's not the best way to actually encourage people to do that because they're not being taken seriously. Um, they yeah. can also fear loss of custody of their children, loss of their family, loss of their livelihood. Um, yes. Especially... We'll say well in what well, in and around those factors um, as well as potential homelessness because again the sense of being able to look after yourself and then have everyone you know and love turn to you and say what, what you know what do you mean she's hitting you why why yeah. why is that an issue when in fact yeah. uh, the deep psychological and emotional abuse that can take place where you are slowly being chipped away at day after day after day yeah. it doesn't have to be you know i say a major physical blowout for that to be incredibly traumatic i mean if you have been broken down over the yeah. case of 10 15 20 years or more in, in cases i've yeah. had myself that person becomes a shell and they are not able to see the light and for us to be able to help that person. Um, mm. So like we have, let's say our clients in the past um, gives us great fulfillment and we want to help anyone and everyone we can. Yeah. yeah. Amy raised a really um, important point that there is no difference amongst both the genders or all genders across. Um, because the way we perceive the issue of domestic abuse is like it only happens to women. Um, men don't get hit. And maybe that's why a lot of men don't come forward because sometimes the abuse is more psychological, like manipulation and coercive control. And they don't identify it as a problem. And only when it is escalates and it starts to kind of threaten their well being, then only they realize that this is an issue. Is this the case, Lee? Sorry, I think you're on mute. Um, we can't hear you. That's my microphone playing up again. <laughs> I can hear you now. <laughs> Intermittent sound. I swear it's one of my yeah. colleagues cutting me off so I don't talk. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I, th I think it's, it's pretty split down the middle because, you know, we do get um, situations where there's a lot of coercion. There's a lot of emotional a lot of psychological stuff going on where men just don't sort of attribute those behaviors to being domestic abuse um mm. i mean talking about my own personal experience i had no idea whatsoever that i was a victim of abuse um i took part in a male program that we were running in worcestershire i was asked to come and help facilitate it um mm. and it was it was an interesting topic for me because when they said you know it's a group for male victims of domestic abuse again my mm. first thought was what uh females are victims of domestic abuse not men um so yeah. kind of a, a a new topic for me so i went along um and the gentleman that was originally 
um, running that course said to me, look, the best way for you to learn is to join in. Um, and what they looked at was the gender neutral version of what's known as the power and control wheel, which looks at behaviors and tactics that are used by perpetrators. Um, and I was watching these men ticking off these behaviors that they'd face themselves within their relationships. Now, the chap that was facilitating it, he said, Lee, join in. It's the best way. Come on, tick, just tick the box and see if anything comes to you. So I started with children um, because I thought that's nice and easy because me and my ex-partner didn't have children. Um, so that was a, a complete blank section. And I was thinking, that's okay. Um, but then when I moved on to the other section, it then became tick after tick after tick after mm -hmm. tick. And I felt as though my whole world just fell out from underneath me because I got out of that relationship. Uh, mm. I was in a, a new relationship by this point, but I'd never considered that I'd been a yeah. victim. Um, mm. And also the impact of that relationship on future relationships and the ability to be able yes. to trust other people, to be able to mm. fully open up to other people. You know, I do, I do still sometimes find myself quite guarded now purely and simply because of some of those behaviors I face. But I think there is the other side to it that, you know, it is perceived that there's not so much physical abuse when it comes to male victims. Um, but that again is, is incorrect. You know, there's, there's lots of evidence. There's lots of academic um, research that's been done in this field that shows that certainly for men who suffer physical abuse, it's more yeah. likely that that purpose to use weapons against them you know we've come across situations of scolding water drinks being used yeah. as a weapon you know i talk to other agencies that i know and certainly stories i hear you really make sure you know men being stabbed in the leg through drivers and saying oh i had an accident i slipped at work you know I think the most prominent case for me was a case that i worked once where a gentleman was found by a, an ambulance under mm -hmm. a walkway, a Passover, with a 12 inch mm -hmm. stiletto heel sticking out of his chest where he'd had, had a deal with his perpetrator and she'd taken off her shoe and hit him so hard that this, mm -hmm. this heel was stuck in his chest. He had to have life-saving surgery, but yeah. still didn't want to pursue things further because he said, I love her, she's not always like this. Amy, how come these things, um, these incidents don't become headlines? How come these um, incidents of crime never become breaking news in the media? Well, it's it's because it's, it's not, you know, they, people see domestic abuse as gendered, don't they, against women. Um, I suppose it's it's not what the, the media want to really kind of pub, publicise, maybe. Um, unless unless it's a really kind of high risk case um that they, they, there's no f and i and also i suppose as well if it is um you know publicized that there is an issue then it will then be publicized and looked into a bit more and seen that it is highly underfunded and you know when a issue is raised then a government has to do a bit more to help and i suppose with with everything going on probably not wanting to put funding into something that actually is is really really needed yeah yeah josh when you come across these cases um what do you think what kind of pattern do you see that most men kind of experience or things that they tend to ignore when it becomes like really really serious Generally, from so well from um, the client base that I've had, the patterns that I have seen is that they haven't. Well, say what they generally don't see it as abuse because mm -hmm. they've mm -hmm. been raised in an environment where that's how relationships are formed, relationships are maintained, and that's just something you put up with, and um, very very old school framing of you know happy wife happy life and yeah. Yeah. oh you know i'm just oh, i'm just getting a bit of grief that's you know that's a relationship when in fact um they are either being physically emotionally financially abused 
Um, I, I've had clients where they, you know, so they've gone to work, earn their money, so they come back home, and they've been left with a hundred pound or less to last them the month, whilst being expected to ferry the kids around, pay for things, and everything else, whilst she has, I say, everything else at her disposal. So the fact that they don't see how that affects them is generally quite shocking because mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of springs to mind so you know you don't know unless you're in it sort of thing but um even when you're in it you can't always see and your family members can't always see the way mm -hmm. relationships are taught to us from mm -hmm. influences from our family influences from school mm -hmm. friendship and how we're sort of left to fend for ourselves in that sense. And because we want to connect, we are social beings, we do yeah. want to see like have families and all of this. Mm. So it it does sort of put them in a trap, to be fair. Well we've spoke about it, haven't we? Is is a team. Mm. Um and you know when when you're looking at how they come up with the figures um on yeah. domestic abuse it's you know you're looking at questions around domestic violence and as we've talked about already it's not just about violence and we've taken a huge step forward moving it to being addressed as domestic abuse yes. but when you talk about men's experiences of going to the police, as we've talked about already, you know, my colleagues have already talked about the lack of service provision that there is out there. You know, you, you, you're asking questions. Has your partner or family member ever displayed a behavior that made you consider going to the police? Well, when you're reading everything online and you're reading about all different men's experiences that have gone to the police and it's been negative, the answer is always going to be no. So when we're talking about an average of 754,000 men estimated, that's a conservative guess. We've changed the way that we structure talking to men about their experiences. Certainly when it comes to talk to us. And we talk about, um, certainly in a way of saying, do you know what, talk to me. Has your partner or family member ever displayed a behavior that made you feel uncomfortable? If that's yeah. the case, Let's explore this a little bit because mm -hmm. it opens up so many doors. Because as soon as you start talking about, you know, have they done something that made you want to go to the police? A lot of people become very guarded. Now that's male and female yeah. because of the potential risk that is there. But yeah. just open it up in a general conversation and saying, do you know what? If they've done something that makes you feel uncomfortable, talk to me about it. It allows you to yeah. explore so much more. It makes people open up so much more. We need to change yeah. the questions being asked. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all right someone saying, oh, are you a victim of domestic abuse? Most people are going to, you know, they're going to turn around and say, no, I'm not, because they're not mm. recognising that the behaviours that are being displayed towards them are abuse, especially if they've mm. grown up with that, you know, that cycle of abuse, especially if they've seen their mm. parent you know, display those behaviours in a relationship. They they're going to see that whole kind of scenarios as normal, and and that kind of, especially with men, you know, in society, mm -hmm. that that's that's where people aren't coming forward and and realising that yeah. abuse, you know, is abuse basically. Yeah, yeah. So you know, when we look at stats, um, they say one out of every three are like they experience some form of domestic abuse in their lifetime. Is, is that true? Is that underreported or overreported? It all depends on where you look. Um, yeah. You know, in different places across the, across the globe, we've seen one in three women, one in four men, one in three mm. women, one in six men. We've even, we also yeah. seen down as far as one in two women, one in three men. Um, you know, mm. there are some people that would argue that it's very 50 50 there's some organizations that have done some extensive research and said actually when you talk to police about this and it's off the record they will say it's very very split down the middle um so we yeah. believe it's it's quite underreported um and we will never truly know the true extent mm. 
And I think the danger is that when you start looking at stats when they're estimated, this is where you get the message being put out into society. Domestic abuse is a gendered crime. It's not a gendered crime. How can anyone say it's gendered when you're looking at an estimated just, just shy of a, a million men in the UK alone each year? And that's estimated. How is that a, a minority victim group? It's not. Yeah. 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 And there's that, that is a know, shocking it is it's very shocking and when you take gender out of it and look at different types of abuse there are mm. there are there are that that's where um confusion can can lie as well i mean there's so many theories out there but but when you take gender out of it and look at sort of situational um couple violence intimate terrorist role you know the the role when someone's basically you know, giving giving something back sort of thing after years of abuse you know there does mm. tend to be um statistics then for that but again because you, someone's taken gender out of it um mm. they're, they're, those statistics aren't really readily available for the different for those different types and that's where there needs to be more research um, and yeah. and then i think that, that you know the, the grounds would probably become a lot more even i just think that there's a lot more to it and because it is such a gendered crime at the moment the way it's looked at um, yes. through a sort of prevalence of it isn't actually um isn't actually you know being shown and so the statistics are never going to um in my opinion be accurate until that's yeah. until that's um until that's done yeah josh you mentioned something about homelessness amongst men and mm -hmm. i think this is an area which is pretty much ignored so for example one or two people out of every 200 in the uk are practically homeless but nobody tries to find out the reason why they become homeless and in cases of abuse where intimate partner relationships is coercive control and um you know any any form of abuse why do you think this is the case because you know there's this um stereotype you may call it or um a stigma or misconception that men are known as the ones who are the providers or um, the ones who control the finances so what makes them reach this stage where they lose control over finances and somebody else is in so much control that they literally kick them out of the house and make them homeless I it generally just starts my... very slowly. Hmm? I've, I've, I've got to be banging on my office door, so if uh, just excuse me one minute, is always <laughs> That's really fine. Josh will Josh will answer that. Meanwhile, See, ain't no worries. Um, so yeah, it generally starts very slowly, um, where they will you know start asking for money for groceries or for the children or to mm. help them mm. because their pay is short this month. You know, and then they're expected to pay for dinners out. They're expected to um, help family members that are in financial binds um, on that side. And it gets to a point where they see that they now have basically forfeited their entire monthly wage and are left yeah. with breadcrumbs to yeah. last them. But they can be brainwashed into seeing that, that, you know, that they are providing, you know, I provide the roof over the head, I'm, you know, putting food on the table, yeah. all these sorts of things. But in terms of homelessness, it can arise when, say, if there are children in the home, the male will tend to remove themselves because they don't want to put their children either in a, I the one, so what, where they're not living in the home, where they are in a refuge or they're living with family, making it a bit more difficult for them to be seen. Um, right. So it can make things difficult. I mean, especially um, since if they are in a service, that would take 4% of men that are generally supported um, so like by local agencies. There are like 39 organisations um, like 238 refuge spaces, but only like 58 of those are actually dedicated to men, because the rest can 
a kind of overflowing female refugees. Because again, having worked in that sector as well, boots, it, mm. it, it's needed because there, there aren't any refuge spaces or there are hardly any for everyone. Everybody is yeah. struggling. Everybody needs that provision. Um, let's say even with like those 58 dedicated beds, mm. that are the could yeah. end up. I said, well, I say it's not enough, but they could end up the other side of the country, making it difficult mm. to find work, live off benefits, um, have access to the children. They can no longer bond with them or take them to school. If they then have to go, um, say, like via a contact centre, abuse can continue there, um, as well as if any contact was made online via FaceTime or via Zoom or Skype or any of those sorts of mediums, that can still be controlled by the perpetrator. That can be minimised to a point where out of the couple of hours that they're supposed to have, they only have half an hour, 20 minutes mm. because of better delays or they're out shopping or they're busy doing other things or they're seeing other family members. So that mm. it does make things incredibly complicated. And so, yeah, it makes it, makes it quite clear why some men say, so well, find it easier to take themselves out of the home because they may have been broken down so much that they see themselves as the issue mm. or say oh I, I didn't love her enough i didn't provide enough i don't have a good enough job i'm you say not a good enough father to the children which is not the case yeah lee sorry you're on mute again if you unmute I, yeah, my... be... <laughs> go no oh. nothing yet I also wanted to know if one of you could answer, um, how common is it to see men taking injunction against a female perpetrator? Because we often hear of stories where a female has escaped an abusive relationship and she feels threatened that her life is in danger. So she has gone to the police or the social services and went for injunction so that there is no contact. What about male victims? Sorry, Lee, we can't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just Maybe George. Yeah, so well, Maybe in terms of injunction, <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> in terms of injunctions, um, that's it. they are accessible to men, but again, there are barriers in place and it makes things quite hard for them to be obtained. Whereas mm. when I've had to get them for female victims and any what say I say any female victim that has needed either a restraining order, prohibited steps orders, or any sort of provision can be a point of oh yeah, we can get you um, an emergency appointment within the next couple of hours, you know, hang around court in the morning and we can squeeze you in and get it done. I've not had that experience with a male victim as of yet. Um, mm. even when I was supporting male victims in, uh, say, what, in a court setting, even seeing other professionals and um, whether that be solicitors, magistrates, there's not a lot of grasp on um, how it can be an issue and just sort of like think, well, you've removed yourself from the property. There, there isn't an issue anymore, where in fact it is because he's still being harassed when he's at work or when he's being harassed um, say outside of work at home with family or say if, if he's gone to they live with parents or something just to you know make ends meet so he can still stay close enough to see the children um that's yeah, another it, it thing um, I've, I've read about many cases many incidents where the female perpetrator has taken the custody of the children or is manipulating her partner, saying that she will take the custody and she'll take the child away. And the male victim is unable to see their see his kids, to have any form of contact. And that's another tool of manipulation that is used against them. If yeah. they dare to yes, yeah. I say as well as um 
her actually putting out injunctions on him. So mm. she has used the system against him to make it even harder for him to see his children and to heal from all of the harm that's happened. And it's just sort of prolonging, say, the abuse through the system. Yeah. How common is psychological control psychological manipulation because we, we we know that there are different forms and different types of abuse that exists um, and mm -hmm. we see patterns of certain types of abuse more prevalent amongst female victims but what about male victims of abuse what are they subjected to frequently is it sexual financial psychological or physical sorry Lee, i think maybe you've turned oh, off yes. your mic Oh no! no. Still... Do you want to no, log out and log back in? Do you think that would help? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, Amy, would you like to answer that meanwhile? Yeah. What was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to know. You know, there are different types of abuse. There's physical, psychological, sexual, financial, spiritual. Which type is more prevalent or more seen amongst male um, victims? What are they subjected to frequently? Um. All of it, to be fair. Um, like I said before, the similarities between men and women as victims are second to none, really. They're very, very, very similar. Um, so the coercion and control um, would be the same as, as for a woman. Um, kids are used. Um, maybe mental, mental illnesses would be used. Money, um, emotional abuse. Um, you know, there can be sort of put downs with, with in relation to um, like personal um, sort of put downs um, in relation mm. to um, personal kind of areas. <laughs> um, you yeah, know, just, just yeah. different, different, you know, just different ways of trying to just make that person feel inadequate and small mm -hmm. and that they mean nothing um you know it happens with women it happens with men um it's just the same across the board it's it's quite scary actually um how similar it is um with regards it's to like with violence bullying, as well. yeah. bullying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, especially in older relationships as well in terms of yeah. if um say any partner is disabled or infirm or is in need of medication, whether that be for a physical ailment or even things like Alzheimer's, mental health issues, all yeah. of these things can be made to make that person feel like a burden, completely useless and mm. being degraded by, well, in such a way by someone they say, that you love and that you hold dear can really deteriorate a person especially yeah. as they're meant to be there as, as perhaps named as their carer which then puts that victim mm, in an even exactly. more vulnerable position it's it's mm. quite scary when you actually look 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 at the kind of facts of it all it, it it's it's um yeah it's it's very scary yeah i'm i'm, I'm hoping like, my microphone see... is back working now it's working perfectly yes, <laughs> brilliant <laughs> brilliant i mean when when you're looking at it it's you know, there's a lot of similarities in, as my colleagues have said, in, in some of the behaviours. But, you know, just to throw a few out there that seem to be quite common, um, certainly looking at financial and economic abuse. You know, we, mm. we've seen male victims being harassed by their perpetrator whilst they're at work. And certainly, as we've already sort of alluded to, you know, when once their money comes in, uh, it goes into the household and then they aren't allowed any money of their own so you know they're, they're going to work they're providing but they is this is a live calling show and i encourage people to call in if they have any questions or if they want to share their experiences because it's really difficult for a man to talk about experiences like these but you've been very brave you've written a big book about your experiences and it's benefiting so many people yeah it's Could it, you it, please... it's it's it is it's a bit of a mix some of the experiences there are my own um some of them are uh clients that we've worked with um sort of sharing everybody's experiences with their permission um uh, because one of the things that became very apparent i mean all of us here 
either have or are in the process of doing our master's degree in understanding domestic and sexual violence. And there's not a lot of material out there in terms of, you know, looking at males as victims. When, when you find a lot of material, it's talking about males as perpetrators. And I think when you've constantly got that message being delivered out there, why would anyone want to come forward? You know, when you read about domestic abuse, why would men want to come forward when they're asked questions like, well, what did you do to make her do that? You know, exactly. it's, it's, yeah. it's victim blaming on a whole nother level. It's very much saying, well, hang on a minute. What, what do you mean you're a victim of domestic abuse? But the problem we've got is until people stand up, talk about their stories and actually start asking for help, this situation's not going to change. A lot of people have spoke to me and my colleagues about the subject of toxic masculinity, um, mm -hmm. being a reason behind perpetration of domestic abuse, certainly in terms of male perpetrators, but that toxic masculinity in a way can also be looked at as a reason for why men don't speak out. Yeah, certainly yeah. some of the beliefs in society around what men are supposed to be, certainly around mm -hmm. some of the things that you, you know, we've had men tell us that their perpetrators have said to them, you know, things along the lines of if you were a real man, you wouldn't put up with this lifestyle. If you were a real man, you'd be able to provide for your family better. You know, when you've got that constant type of manipulation and putting you down going on, you start to question yourself. You start to believe some of the things that are said because it's, it, so there's it's a lot of gaslighting going on. Mm. Absolutely. Gaslighting is massive. We, we, you know, we talk to men that start to question their mental oh, yeah. health. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. I myself have been uh, subjected to that. Certainly one of the things that I've talked about in the book um, is a story of when a gentleman was coming home from work and putting his keys in a bowl because he was quite forgetful uh, and he would lose mm. his keys. That was me. Uh, and what was happening is I was going to go out and go into the bowl and the keys weren't there. So I was then retracing my steps around the house, trying to find them, going back, and then the keys were there in the bowl. And it was like, I swear they weren't there. And this went on for some time and I really started to question my own sanity um, to the point wow. it became quite worrying for me until I caught her out one day. Uh, I was adamant that I'd done it and I was watching over the banister of the house and I saw her put the keys back in and I went down and I picked them up out the bowl and said, um, did you just put the keys back in the bowl because they weren't there a minute ago? And she said, no, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, I, I just saw you do it. Mm. And the response I got was, look, I know how bad your mental health's been recently. I know how forgetful you've been getting. I saw them on the table and I didn't want you to feel that, you know, this was an issue. So I put them there, but I've never done it before. And yet you know, this is something that happens so much. And there's so many men that, you know, have had these issues where they're really questioning their whole existence. And what I'd say to people is if this is happening to you, speak out because what happens is it, it's the same with anybody. It affects your mental health. When you affect your mental health, you're going into lots of different areas there. We know that suicide mm. rates are highest yes. within. Yeah. We know from statistics from other agencies that, that men that have talked about being victims of domestic abuse, 11% have attempted suicide but how many have actually gone the full extent and are no longer with us because of the extent of the abuse that they've suffered i i believe it's it's extremely high and that is never talked about yeah. Yeah. lee i want you to give some more examples from your personal life when did you reach that point in your life when that moment of realization where you thought okay this is it i'm gonna leave this person is not gonna change how did that happen how did you reach that point it happened before i even realized that i was being subjected to domestic abuse um there was lots of stuff that went on within the relationship um stuff that was turned back on myself to make me feel guilty um one of the things that 
sticks with me an awful lot is having that suspicion that something was going on, knowing that there, you know, potentially there was something going on behind my back uh, with somebody else, little comments that have been made to other people. Um, but every time I tried to broach the subject, it was like you're paranoid. You know, mm. there, there, there was a situation where a family member had had quite a serious operation um, and I was worried, you know, I, I'm, I'm a genuine person. I worry about people. Um, and my ex-partner was asleep on the sofa. Um, she did have some issues with alcohol um, mm. and her phone kept going off. And my concern was that, oh, I, I hope something hasn't happened to, to, to this family member. So because it kept going off, I tried to wake her, couldn't wake her. So I checked the phone because I needed to know whether it was something that happened. And what I was confronted with was a whole stream of explicit text messages that had been passed between her and her ex-boss, who I'd heard lots of rumours about um, something going on between them. By this point, obviously, things were a little bit too late because I'd already been put in a position where I had taken on a lot of financial burden from the household uh, in terms mm. of her up debts and me reconsolidating into my name. Um, and when the conversation came about that all this stuff was coming to light, um, it all turned on me and how dare you look at my phone, how dare you invade my privacy, uh, which I then started blaming myself for. But, you know, I checked mm. because I was concerned about a family member, you know, how dare you put me in this position? It's your fault. You lead me to drink with your behavior. Um, projecting and, everything on you, projecting everything on um, you. You know what? And the saddest thing is, like so many men, I accepted mm. it. And, you know, I, I took this as being my fault. And it's only later on down the line when somebody actually explained to me, this is what domestic abuse is. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit emotional talking about this. Um, That's okay. The, and thank you so really much for sharing it. this. Uh, Lee, if you could just um, show your book if it's nearby so that if any person watching this program right now is interested to learn more, then they know exactly what book to go for and where to get it from. Because we, we've, our we've, aim is to spread awareness. Yeah, we've only got the original version to show at the moment, which is this book here. This was originally on Amazon. Now, it's not on Amazon at the moment because we have just uh, last year secured a publishing deal with a major um, UK publisher who has publishing houses right around the globe. So they have four different publishing houses. It is being released into mainstream bookstores uh, and onto Amazon on the 30th of November. So literally in a month's time, uh, it's going to be back out there in the new format all updated we look at all the different types of abuse we look at help that should be available in terms of laws we give guidance on you know being able to access children and, and the court process there as well as looking at things like disabilities and how they're used there's literally something for everybody we've had victim survivors we've had professionals we've had family members all coming out and saying this is helped there are organizations that are using this as sort of a blueprint model for the support that they're giving men as well. So, you know, as we, as I said before, if it helps just one person, yeah, it's amazing. Course, yeah. But yeah. we just hope. Our job is done. The, yeah. The <laughs> biggest hope is that when someone reads this, if someone thinks, do you know what? There are behaviors in my relationship that just don't feel right to me. I feel uncomfortable yeah. with the way they treat me that maybe they'll give this a read. Maybe they'll look mm. at it. They'll look at the behaviors and the experiences suffered by other men and realize, do you know what? And I say this to men because we're talking about men, but this goes to any victim of domestic abuse. You are not alone. Speak up, talk to people, talk to us. You know, there's contact ways that you can contact us through our website and someone will always answer. You don't have to suffer this abuse in silence. Thank you so much for that. Any final message from you, Amy, before we end the show? Similar to Lee, you know, any victim, you're not alone. 
you know, we're three very experienced personally and academically. Um, we've all worked within the sector. Um, confidentiality is paramount. Anytime, you know, just, just drop the line and we're happy to help anybody. Exactly. Domestic abuse is a human issue as well. I think, nor does it discriminate no matter your race, gender, religion, age or class. We're all here to help. We want to help. And if we can, we will. Thank you so much. And for Thank all the people who are, it was an absolute honor. And all the people who are watching right now, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, Josh, Lee, or Amy, personally, privately, um, you can visit their website, breakthesilenceuk.co.uk, am I right? Um, yeah. And you can contact them. And Lee's book is also available out there if you would like to have a read, because often we don't understand that we are in an abusive relationship until we see someone else in a similar situation and suffering the same way that we are. And then only we realize, okay, this is wrong. Um, and we gave, I mean, our guests gave some brilliant examples today of what um, being in an intimate partner abusive relationship looks like. Amy mentioned about um, coercive control, manipulation. Lee gave examples as well. The forms of um, abuse, for example, um, financial, psychological, sexual, spiritual even. So if you are currently a victim, do not feel ashamed. Don't blame yourself. Seek help. Help is out there. Um, you can reach out to Break the Silence UK. You can call our studio number and we'll pass on the contact details of our amazing guest today. Once again, thank you so much, Josh, Lee, and Amy, thank you for taking the time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Bye. 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 And to all our Lee viewers, and, um, um, and, and she had three children. So um, before we end the show, I just wanted to say that um, look after yourself, especially your mental health. And next Saturday, we'll see you again with another amazing guest and a topic related to your well-being and mental health. Till then, take care. Assalamu alaikum.